Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is John C. Goodman, senior fellow at the Independent Institute and president and founder of the Goodman Institute for Public Policy Research. He is the author of Priceless, Curing the Healthcare Crisis, and the new book, A Better Choice, Healthcare Solutions for America. He is also the co-author of 1992's Patient Power from the Cato Institute. He has been called the father of health savings accounts. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Glad to be with you. So I'd like to start with the title of your last book, as you, you mentioned in your newest book, which is a sort of summation of parts of your last book. But the title of your last book, Priceless, is an intentional double entendre. Uh, um, it is. Um, so, so in what way is the American healthcare system priceless? Well, in one sense, there are no real prices in the medical marketplace and uh, it's priceless in that sense. But at the same time, your health care is priceless and I wanted to get both of those ideas across. So how do we get to a priceless I – mean, it's a very big question but – and it's almost the entire question of this podcast. But how do we get to a priceless American health care system? Well, how we got there was over a 100-year period. We have uh, completely suppressed normal market forces and we've done it year after year, decade after decade until we reach a point where no one sees a real price for anything, no doctor, no patient, no employer, no employee. What does that mean to not see a real price though? Because if I go to the doctor, I get a bill and it's got costs on it. So there's, there is a price I'm looking at. Well, when you walk in the doctor's office and you ask what this is going to cost, they probably don't know. And um, there is no real price there. It's, uh, they have different uh, payment rates from different insurers. So depending on whether you have Blue Cross or Aetna or Medicare, uh, the, the the reimbursement or the payment would be different. Those aren't real prices. Those that's not what happens in a normal market. You don't go to a restaurant and you pay one fee, and the table next to you pays a different fee for the same food. So what happened? I mean, in 1935, uh, just pulling a random year, um, there was health insurance. I assume was it or did it exist? And, in the before then, or, or well, there was very little then. But over the period of the 20th century, uh, principally because of the American Medical Association, uh, people did get pushed into health insurance uh, schemes. That um, and, and we encouraged through the tax law for people to uh, use uh, insurance rather than out-of-pocket payment, uh, third-party insurance rather than self-insurance through a health savings account. We encourage through the tax law people to get group insurance through an employer rather than have it on their own uh, because the tax advantages are there. And we – because there's an open-ended tax subsidy, we encourage people to overinsure. So at the end of the day, we have insurance companies paying almost all the bills and when third-party insurers uh, – and by that I mean insurance companies and government and employers – when they're paying all the bills instead of the patient – uh, the providers no longer are competing for us on the basis of price and quality and access to care. And so out of pocket was probably most of the way that medical costs were paid for in the 30s. Insurance starts to come around in the 50s and, and the first big U.S. program is Medicare and Medicaid, correct? For I mean like big top-down programs. Those are the first big government programs and they're huge. And we have almost 50 million people in Medicare and um, maybe 70 million people or so in, in Medicaid. So these are huge programs and uh, all run by government and all the bills are paid by government. But how do those affect the price of health care in general? They, mean, have, they have effects on the price. You mean the cost? Yes, on the cost, um, yeah. Well, um, we didn't have a serious health care inflation problem until 1965 when we got Medicare and Medicaid. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot of evidence that the introduction of Medicare – made much difference for the health care of the elderly. But we still, we definitely spent a lot of money, uh, our taxpayer money, and that additional spending, billions and billions of dollars, forced up prices. And uh, it's, been, it's been going on ever since. But how much of that is policy forcing up prices and how much of that is simply medical care becoming more sophisticated? Because I mean medical care and prior to the 20th century, for all intents and purposes, didn't really exist. I mean there wasn't there wasn't much they could do and what they could do was pretty cheap. But then we had radical explosion in what we're capable of which brought a whole lot of technology and that stuff's expensive. Well, it's expensive because uh, we reward the kind of technology that increases costs and therefore increases uh, payments by third-party payers. You know, if you contrast this with a field like uh, uh, cosmetic surgery or LASIK surgery where there are no third-party payers, 
we've had in those two fields a tremendous innovation, tremendous in, uh, innovation and, and technological advance, and yet the real price keeps coming down. So in a normal market, uh, technological improvement tends to lower costs. Only in healthcare does it uh, continue to raise costs. But aren't those? I mean, those things are elective surgeries. They're not. They're not necessary care. You can choose not to get. LASIK and you can get glasses which are good enough um, and you can choose not to get cosmetic surgery and so to some extent we're very price sensitive on that. Like they they have to keep costs down, right? Or people will just opt out. But cancer treatments you can't opt out of, you know, kidney they, dialysis, yeah, heart attacks. And, and so and those also have a huge technological component. Yes, but you're not focusing on the right variable here. Uh, uh, people can choose not to do a lot of things in healthcare. A lot of people who could use a knee replacement don't choose to get their knee replaced. So there's a, a, lot, a lot of choices are being made. But that's not what's critical here. What's critical is who pays the bill. And uh, when we pay the bill ourselves, there's never a question about price. Uh, uh, we, we know when you're going for cosmetic surgery procedure, you, you know in advance what the price is going to be. Same for LASIK surgery. Same for the walk-in clinics. Where, wherever the third parties aren't, uh, you know what the prices are and you also know that the providers are competing for your business based on uh, price, quality and access. How much of this though is – we, do we want prices in there in the sense that – do we want people facing these bills and making those decisions when they're in a highly vulnerable state? You've just found out that you have pancreatic cancer. You know, you're not necessarily – Thinking straight, you're in stages of grief and now you have to make these decisions about whether you want to bankrupt your family in order to support yourself. Um, that It seems like – I mean if we analogize that to – there are other areas where people are in highly emotional states, right, when they buy stuff, where there are markets and yet the prices are extraordinary. Something like the wedding and funeral industry. So there's competition <laughs> in the wedding and funeral industry but Gamble, it doesn't seem to be doing much. The prices are – extraordinary, certainly way above what they would need to be to have even enormous profits in these things. But people just can't think straight when a, lo when a loved one has just died or when they're about to have you know, the most important day of their life. Or when they have pancreatic cancer. Right. And so do we want you – know, you could make the argument that like, look, we want to protect them from that. We want them to not have to think about that and just be able to get the health care that they need. What we want is what Adam Smith wrote about uh, 200 years ago and that is we want people on the producer, supplier side to find it in their self-interest to meet our needs and that's what's critical here. Uh, it, 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 it makes it more difficult if it's an emotional situation but people can have advisors and have doctor advisors and, uh, um, and that works quite well. But if on the supply side of the market, people are not trying to meet our needs, if, if they're not competing on price and quality and access, then um, – then they're not going to meet our needs very well. How do you react when someone says, which I'm sure you've had many times, and maybe you've already answered this question, that healthcare is a right? Well, I react by saying that no country in the world has made healthcare a right. It's just rhetoric. Uh, if you live in Canada, you don't have a right to any particular medical procedure. Uh, you don't have a right to an MRI scan. Uh, you don't even have a right to a place in line if you're the 50th heart patient waiting for surgery. You're not entitled to the 50th surgery. Other people can get in front of you. In fact, Americans can go up and pay the hospital and get ahead of you. You mean just, so just as a matter of both legal, they don't have a right to it legally and they don't have a right to it functionally? Yes, and, and yet they continue to use the language of rights because it somehow makes everybody feel, feel good. Uh, so, so the right to health care has no content as far as I'm concerned. That is, is meaningless. Um, what is meaningful is designing a healthcare system that meets people's needs efficiently and does so at minimum cost and produces high quality results and, and doesn't make us wait for months or years to get it. And that's something you've written about uh, a lot in the in all of your books, but the time price versus the money price. Uh, can you explain a little bit how that works? Well, uh, people on the left tend to ignore uh, the time price of care, and that's because they believe in healthcare systems where money plays no real role. Uh, money from the patient. And so instead of rationing on the basis of price, we ration by waiting. Uh, by the way, we've also done that in our country. We, we wait for care everywhere. Um, we just don't wait as long as the Canadians wait. But waiting is costly. Uh, time is valuable. Uh, the the walk-in clinics in the CVS pharmacies are called minute clinics. And the reason for that term is they're suggesting to you they know your time is valuable as well as your money. 
And that's what we would expect to happen in a real market for health care. But don't those – I mean those emergency – those clinics, um, urgent care, they take our insurance. I mean what – how are they different from the hospitals and wherever else? And they also don't tell me – I mean I take my kids to urgent care and they don't tell us the prices up front. But we also don't wait very long. Well, at the walk-in clinics, uh, they came into existence to cater to people who were paying out of pocket with their own money. Now, through time, uh, the insurers began to pay for their services because they realized that this is much cheaper than having the patient go to the doctor's office or the emergency room. But uh, essentially, it was a market formed to deal with people paying with their own money. And, and generally, when people pay with their own money, they don't, they're not asked to guess what the price is going to be. So at the Mena Clinic, you actually have a price list. And if you have an earache or sore throat, you, you know in advance what you're going to pay. Um, so this is what happens in a normal market. Now, some people I can hear my left-wing friends in my, in my ear and, and I understand the argument. Some people say that, well, this is entirely unfair, uh, that we – you shouldn't have to think about how much health care you need. You shouldn't have to think about whether you have enough money to fix your knee or fix anything, whether rich people can have a knee and you can't have a knee is fundamentally unfair. Uh, we need to fix that in some way as a matter of simple justice. It needs to be fixed uh, by – Doing, paying for it from above or, or uh, subsidizing or doing price controls or anything like this, that just the basic premise of people paying for health care is unfair. Yes, I, I'm, I'm moving in the opposite direction. I think um, a lot of evidence uh, is out there that people uh, can manage their own health care with a little bit of training instructions from providers. And if people are going to manage their care, uh, they'll do a better job if they manage the money that pays for that care. So I believe in health savings accounts. I would make it easier for employers and insurance companies to put money into health savings accounts so people are willing to manage their own care. And people need to always be conscious that health care costs money. And, and, and if they know what the real cost is, then they can make trade-offs. You know, imagine a mother who wakes up in the middle of the night and her daughter is sick. Does she take that daughter to the emergency room or not? Who's the best person to make that decision? The mother is. So the mother should know what the cost is and, and she is in the best position to evaluate the need. How much of a difference does it make where that money they're spending comes from? So if they are spending their own money out of their pocket and they're, you know, they're seeing the prices and they're choosing between them versus we've given them say a voucher that then they can spend but they're still seeing prices and choosing between providers. Well, I think uh, people need to understand is their money, and a voucher doesn't quite sound like money. So, but if, if there's a if there's an account, and uh, and they can see how much is in the account when they spend from it, uh, it's like like uh, any other account. Um, that's important. Um, people will be better managers of healthcare dollars than employers or insurance companies or, or government. There's there's no substitute for the patient uh, managing the money. Two of your total books, uh, Patient Power and then Priceless and then the kind of addendum or, or summation of Priceless in the new book. But you mentioned in the introduction of Priceless that you could have called it doctor power, which is an interesting element of you have patient power and doctor power, which seems to connect these two parts of your thinking that you have to be looking at both the demand and the supply side if you want to do any serious healthcare policy whatsoever. I want to liberate the market and there are two sides of the market, the people getting the served and the people doing the service. Um, Doctors are, are horribly constrained uh, by the third-party payer system and by that again, I mean by employers, insurance companies and government. Uh, so I want to liberate the doctor and liberate the patient and um, let them interact with each other as they would in a normal marketplace. Well, so on the third-party payer system uh, with a little bit more, I guess, history involved, why do we get insurance through our jobs? To, why do so many of us do that? Well, it was an accident in World War II. Uh, we had price controls. But uh, for some reason, the federal government decided that if employer provided insurance, uh, that that didn't count or wasn't covered with the price control. So instead Which of paying – price controls on wages? Price controls on wages. What would – well, just – what's the – what was the motive behind that? What would – in it's in wartime and we're saying as part of what we're doing during wartime, employers can't compete with each other on how high of wages they're willing to pay? It's in wartime and a lot of resources are going into the war and that means that people with the same income now are chasing fewer goods and services. And so the government mistakenly decided that it would control prices and wages. In any event, uh, they decided that uh, money spent by an employer on health care didn't count as part of the wage. 
although it surely is t- part of the total compensation. To, to the business at least, to the yes. employer. So that decision was made and then the IRS followed up and decided, well, OK, we won't tax uh, contributions for health insurance the way we tax wages. And, um, and from then on, uh, health insurance provided at work was a tax-favored uh, benefit. And, you know, if you're in the 50 percent tax bracket, um, that means that the subsidy you get from having an employer pay your premium is 50 percent. So that's, that's quite large. But even if you're in the 25 or 35 percent bracket, uh, the subsidy is large. Can you break that down just a little bit more exactly how that works? So you, you basically are faced with a choice where your total compensation package includes – let's say you make $50,000 a year. You have $9,000 that, that your employer spends on your health care plan that has a tax break behind it. But you could, you could decline the health care plan and then get money in return. But that money is now taxed, correct, at your wage rate. That's basically what you're saying here. Well, we don't generally give employees the right to choose between uh, health insurance and wages. And in fact, the, the federal law makes it difficult to do that. But it is definitely true that in the aggregate, uh, health insurance is a substitute for wages. And so all employers know this and employees know that. And um, in your example, uh, the total compensation package is $59,000 and 50000 is wages and 9000 is health insurance. The 50000 wages gets taxed. Let's say it's a 30 percent tax. The $9,000 um, is not being taxed. So, so the implicit subsidy there is 30 percent of 9000 so That's $3,000. So the, uh, the government in that example is paying for a third of the cost of the health insurance. So if the health insurance – if employers started offering this during World War II, but you had mentioned when Trevor asked about 1935 and whether people had health insurance or not, there wasn't a lot of it. So did – was health insurance something prior to employers starting to provide it that people had been buying most – like lots of people have been buying from themselves and then they're like, oh, great. Now my employer is giving it to me or did the – this you know, route around the price control create the market for insurance? Well, prior to World War II, there was very little health insurance. Uh, after World War II, it became more common uh, for reasons we've discussed. Employers saw an advantage to providing it. But also remember, one of you remarked earlier that um, in an earlier age, there wasn't much doctors could do. Um, I just watched a movie the other night, The Last Hurrah, and the, uh, the politician is, has got a heart condition and the doctor says, well, you know, you'd be best to go home and be in your bed. Well, we wouldn't do that today, right? We would have, <laughs> have him in the hospital. We would have him cook, hooked up to all kinds of monitors. So health care becomes more expensive and therefore the desire to have health insurance increases. So those two things tended to go together. The uh, It seems to me too that after that, we get this increase in expense, but now you have a problem where you're not – you're insured. And so I, I assume that more and more people are getting insured starting with the tax break through their employer. Just It kind of just goes up over time, I imagine. The amount of people – after the tax break comes in, the amount of people getting insurance through their employer continues to increase. And now you have a different kind of market because the employers are shopping for insurance for their employees. So there's another intermediary between the – the patients and the insurance and that creates maybe distortions of some sort. Well, absolutely because um, you you have a not necessarily long-term relationship with employer and not a long-term relationship with the insurance company and yet they're paying all the bills. And um, um, when they're paying the bills, the doctor see, tends to view the, uh, the insurance company or the employer as, as his customer, uh, not the patient. And it's the, the bill payer that influences what the doctor does a lot more than what would be good for the patient. Uh, so third-party payment automatically distorts the incentives of the doctor, but it also distorts the incentives of the patient. If I know I'm not going to pay anything out of pocket for an MRI scan, uh, I'm more likely to get the scan, even if it's unnecessary. Well, this is one of the weird things about calling health insurance – Insurance, and so I'm curious. I guess if it's always been this way from that World War II on, that you know I have I have house insurance, but if I decide you know my curtains get ruined or something and I need to replace them, my house insurance doesn't cover that. It's for if the place burns down or something. And I have auto insurance, but that's if my car gets really wrecked. But otherwise, there's this extremely high deductible, right? But health insurance works 
basically, I mean, I just never the opposite pay. opposite of that pretty Yeah, much. I never pay anything. It's not really insurance. It's like an alternate way of paying for health care. Was that how insurance worked when the employers were first providing it during World War II or is that something that's come about over time? Well, you're correct that insurance today is prepayment for the consumption of medical care. It's not real insurance. Early insurance was real insurance. Now, the American Medical Association uh, has had a political agenda that goes all the way back to the middle of the 19th century. And one of their goals was to change how health insurance worked. And um, the hospitals um, uh, created Blue uh, Shield and uh, Blue Cross and the doctors created Blue Shield. And in both cases, they created these entities because they wanted their bills paid. So they didn't want insurance to act like uh, auto insurance or uh, homeowner's insurance. They wanted um, uh, insurance uh, plans that, that got all the ba- bills paid. And in fact, in the early days of Blue Cross, not so long ago, uh, the way Blue Cross would pay hospitals is based on how many bed days uh, their patients were there. So let's say that Blue Cross had half the bed days over a year. Uh, then Blue Cross would pay the hospital half of its cost for a year. So it's cost plus reimbursement. And a lot of, and all the other insurers were forced to pay the same way. So we l- literally suppressed the market in health insurance. We, uh, the, the hospitals, the doctors did not want it to work like normal insurance. So we get uh, what you described. It's not like real insurance. Well, why did why did the doctors get that cushy system and the hospitals get that? I mean, I I could imagine that auto mechanics would love it if car insurance worked the same sort of way. And, and auto detailers and people yeah. who clean your car and they could all get together and make it all be auto insurance. So is there something way. special about health care that allowed it to become that kind of insurance? The doctors have been the uh, historically the most powerful of the lobbying groups. Uh, they didn't want for they didn't want for profit medical schools, and so they used their lobbying power to to wipe out uh, that. And so all medical schools became non profit. They didn't want for profit hospitals. They wanted, and so they used their lobbying power to greatly reduce the number of for profit hospitals. They really didn't want for profit health insurance companies. And Blue Cross originally was not for profit at all. So so they used their political power. And then they set up Blue Cross, they set up Blue Shield, and they went to the legislature and, and Blue Cross Blue Shield got certain privileges that other insurers didn't have. That allowed them to uh, become dominant in the market and, and, and once they were dominant, a company, say like Aetna, uh, would come to the hospital and the hospital would say, well, we're not going to deal with you at all unless you pay for uh, pay us the way Blue Cross pays. So that's how the market evolved. I describe this as the complete suppression of normal market forces. And by let's say, well, actually, let's say the early '90s when you first get a, a Hillary Care, as I guess what it was called, but it had some features that were common to the Affordable Care Act. But the crisis of the uninsured. How much was that a an unemployment problem or a an underemployment problem or some sort of between jobs problem? Well, it's all of that. Um, people between jobs are unemployed. Um, anyone on his own who buys health insurance doesn't get the same tax break that employers get unless he uh, unless he's qualified as an um, um, uh, uh, independent business. Um, uh, and and so um, so yes, we we subsidize employer provided insurance and we penalize people who obtain it on their own. And then we have a quote unquote crisis for the uninsured. But that also seems to create a problem of not having that dynamic market of insurance raises the question about you know, quote unquote how the real insurance market would 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 uh, operate because people are going to always say, well, in any free market of insurance, the insurer is going to try and kick off all the sick people and make sure it has no sick people on there and that's what a free market insurance is going to look like. Uh, but some of that – Appearance of insurance seems to be how insurance appears seems to have been created by this employer system and these other kind of uh, distortions. Well, um, actually, it's the other way around. That, that under Obamacare, the insurers are running away from sick people and they only want healthy people, and that's very evident in the way they're competing. Uh, they have very narrow networks. Uh, in Dallas, for example, Blue Cross in the exchange pays doctors ten percent less than Medicaid pays. So um, so they have really low fees. Uh, the best doctors don't join their networks. 
But since they're paying low fees, they can get their premium down. They're convinced that only healthy people, uh, that healthy people only pay attention to price. And so they'll be attracted by low premiums. They won't look at the network. The only people who look at networks are people who are sick. And so that's the way the insurers are acting. What I would regard as a real market for insurance would be one in which insurers get real premiums that reflect expected costs. And in a real market, you would find people specializing in cancer care and care for AIDS patients and care for heart patients. And they would try to attract patients with problems because in a normal market, um, uh, when people have problems, um, uh, there are opportunities to make a profit. Yeah, I guess there are roofers and people out there to – Fix your teeth, and I mean, there's dental insurance, but that's very different than other types of. But there, there are all these things out in their market that try to fix your problems, and but isn't it just sort of unseemly that they're trying to get a profit off of no. sick people? No, no, no. Uh, again, back to Adam Smith. <laughs> we we want it. We, you want people to find it in their self-interest to meet your needs. You know, one way to think about health insurance is to compare it to other kinds of insurance. We all see these ads for casualty insurance on TV and. And one of the ads, uh, the actor standing in front of the town, he says it took you know 20 seconds for this town to be destroyed, and that's the Allstate ad. And then all the Aflac ads are communicating the same message. Um, the message is that uh, we know you don't think about health insurance until you have a real problem. If you have a real problem, then we'll be there. Uh, health insurers don't advertise that way. Uh, the health insurers don't <laughs> never say if you have cancer, you have AIDS, boy, are we the plan for you. It's just the opposite. Uh, they tend to show pictures of young, healthy people because that's who they want to join their plan. Uh, they, they, are, they do not want to attract people with problems. But, I mean, a lot of medical problems show up when you least expect it, you know. And so what's to stop in a free market for health care – you, yeah, they attract me when I'm young and healthy and then I get cancer and they dump me. I mean that seems like a big concern as well is that we just – you you get sick and you suddenly become the very expensive person and now either your premium shoots so high up that you might as well not have insurance because you can't afford them or they just kick you out entirely and we don't have a legal regime to protect you from that. Well, in most states, uh, that has been illegal for decades. Uh, insurers cannot kick people out uh, of a plan simply because they get sick, and that's been federal law for since 1996. Uh, and and it should be the law. Um, uh, part of the insurance contract should be that that you can continue to renew, and that when your health status changes, they don't get to jack up your rates or kick you out of the plan. It's the law now. It's been federal law for quite a long time. It was law in most states for a long, long time, and uh, and that's the way the law should read. But the Obamacare situation is in your newest book. It it seems to be, as you mentioned already, with how they're running away from sick people. It's producing a lot of the exact opposite of what it was intended to produce. Um, well, Obamacare is bait and switch. Uh, President Obama said, you know, if you're sick, you've got a pre-existing condition, the insurers aren't going to be able to discriminate against you. Well, true enough, they can't deny you enrollment in their plan, but they're discriminating in a different way. They're getting very, very narrow networks that leave out the best heart doctors, the best cancer doctors, and they hope you won't join their plan. And if you do, they hope you won't like it and you'll go join some other plan. So we just substituted one kind of discrimination for another. How do those narrowed networks work? Um, because if – if these doctors are opting out of them, that you're the best heart surgeon and you opt out because they're not paying you enough, but now how are you earning anything? Because how many people are going to buy heart surgery without insurance? Well, now I'm talking about what happens in the Obamacare exchanges and there are only about six to eight million people in those exchanges. Okay. So we've got 150 million people getting insurance from an employer and they're, they're not having those same perverse uh, incentives. But it could expand to the rest of us, so we need to worry about it. Let's go back a little bit and just sort of set the scene because Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, passed in 2010. And first of all, the question is: a lot of people said it was a conservative plan originally, or it was very much like a conservative plan. So the first question is: was it? How was it like a conservative plans for health care? Well, it's a managed competition plan in which people. Uh, pay the same premium, community-rated premium, regardless of their health condition. Uh, this has been the way – That's the, a price control essentially, correct? Yes, it is. Now, this has been the way the federal employees uh, plan has worked for uh, for many, many years. 
and uh, Hillary Clinton uh, tried to design her reform based on the federal employees uh, system and so did Mitt Romney uh, and so did Barack Obama. And along the way, the Heritage Foundation, some other conservative think tanks thought this was a good idea. Uh, but you got to remember in a community-rated system, no one's paying the right price. So it means that some people are, are being undercharged and they will overinsure and other people are being overcharged and they will underinsure. So no one's paying the right price. No one's got the right kind of insurance. And um, for the federal employees, you had the Office of Personnel Management sort of r- rode herd on the system and the insurers had kind of gentlemanly competition. So th- the problems weren't that bad. What's happening in the Obamacare exchanges is we're, we're getting doggy dog competition. <laughs> this, this is real fierce competition. And when people compete in the face of perverse incentives, you get real perverse outcomes. Now, if I can set up the scene because some of these things I think are still inscrutable to people about what the Affordable Care Act is, it's a command that you can't deny pre-existing coverage based on pre-existing conditions. It's price controls, community rating based on that. It's a mandate that you have to buy health insurance or have an empl- get it through an employer. And then for those who aren't part of that, it creates these exchanges, which is what you've mentioned. But for those who don't understand these, what are these exchanges you're talking about? Well, uh, this is the individual market, people who buy insurance on their own. And the exchanges um, have basically taken over that market. And uh, you go electronically online and buy insurance. And you've probably read horror stories about how difficult this is. But if you're sick enough, you'll you'll bear with it. And what we're finding out is that uh, the people are sicker than we really imagined they would be. And if they're sicker, that means costs are higher. And that's why we're now for next year getting really high premium increases with with some Blue Cross plans, for example, asking for 50 percent increases around the country. Um, so that's that's the exchange and um, that's what's happening. And this is – this was expected, would you say, or is this worse than was expected? What, what were the predictions? Now, on the other side too, I want to push back and say that you do hear you have, if you were reading if you read the Huffington Post or you listen to President Obama, you hear tons and tons of data about how it's working, how people are covered, price the price curve is is steady, is going down for the first time in ten years, coverage is higher, people are satisfied, they have as many as many stats on the other side about how it's working as as this side, is your side has about how it's not working. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, I don't play I don't I don't play that game. Yeah, but, uh, but, 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 but I mean are some of their stats are more people covered? Well uh, may I put it in slightly different way. Okay. <laughs> For me it's not an issue. I mean, here's some good points, here's some bad points. That's maybe a wash. What we need to think about is what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen is a death spiral. And a death spiral occurs when you get higher costs than expected and the insurers raise their premiums to cover those costs, and as they do so, healthy people tend to drop out. The only people who remain are sick, and so you have to have another round of price increases, and that keeps on going until in the end, the premium you're charging is about equal to the cost of medical care. No one can afford it. And that a death spiral is the insurance industry equivalent of bankruptcy. So that could happen in the exchange, and if it does – then I suspect that what would happen is the government would step in and uh, uh, run the entire exchange program like like another Medicaid program. Government would just end up providing the insurance and paying the bills. And this is the thing that strikes strikes me as odd is because right now I think the fine for a single person not buying insurance, the tax, sorry, uh, is ninety five dollars, and um, so that means I could either and they can't deny me from getting insurance if I get sick, if I didn't have insurance. So I can either pay, let's say, $2,500 in a year for insurance um, or I can wait until I get sick um, and then still get insurance and pay a $95 fine. Why, how is it so clear to us I – mean, this, is, this is me trying to push back on myself. That seems so obvious. What did they do to try and keep that from happening? It can't be as clear that this is just going to go spinning down the drain. They, they, they had to have seen that this was in the law, that the incentives weren't there or am I, am I well, giving maybe, too much credit? Well, we're in uncharted waters and so nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. I can tell you that uh, this last tax period, uh, more than 7 million people paid that tax because they didn't have health insurance. And there are millions more that uh, didn't pay a tax because they were exempted for one reason or another. 
So um, so a lot of people aren't paying the tax, and, you, and you're absolutely right. If they develop a serious illness, they're going to find a way to get health insurance. And that contributes to death spirals, that, that people stay out while they're healthy. They only enter when they're sick, and um, that means the cost of insurance really gets high. Couldn't we solve it, though, by just jacking up that fine? You just keep raising it until people start buying insurance? We could indeed. Or tax. We could Sorry. indeed. But the, the, the problem with the Obama administration is although they argued forcefully for a mandate, they exempted millions and millions of people. I mean, you, you know, if you, if you, if, if you got uh, your electricity cut off for a month or two, you're exempted from the fine. Uh, if, if you don't owe income taxes, you're exempted from the fine. They, they, they found dozens and dozens of reasons to exempt people. And, um, and, and and what you're suggesting is, no, let's go in the other direction. Let's, let's, let's make it even more onerous if they don't insure. Well, interestingly, as a, as a legal point, uh, it, it could be possible based on Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in the, Obama, in the first Affordable Care Act case that a too high – a fine that was too high would be unconstitutional. We have no idea where that is but it could be possible if it's, if it's almost punitive. But, but given his – Willingness to, to save the bend law. things around, it's <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens. But. I, think, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, we never had to have a mandate in the first place despite, uh, despite the claims that it was needed. Uh, in our Medicare program, uh, we have community rated guaranteed issue which means they can't turn you down for Medicare Part B, for Medicare Part D which is the drug program and for Medigap insurance. So all the seniors uh, – pay community rated, can't deny them care, uh, and yet there's no mandate. How do we do that? Well, the way we do that is we tell the senior, if you don't join when you're first eligible, your premium is going to go up. And in the Medigap insurance market, uh, they can actually underwrite you if you don't join when you're eligible. You said that to some extent we're in uncharted waters here and don't know exactly how everything will play out. But Massachusetts had a system at least somewhat similar to this for a while before Obamacare. So how have things – first, how have things played out in Massachusetts and then can we draw conclusions from that to what may happen nationwide? Massachusetts had almost everybody insured before they started. So they had less than 10 percent uninsured. They insured about half of those. Um, What's happening with Obamacare is a far larger pool of people, lots and lots of people who were sitting on the sidelines with medical problems uh, and didn't have insurance. And now all of a sudden these people get highly subsidized insurance. Um, it may settle down and uh, work uh, in a reasonable way. But in the back of my mind, uh, I think we should keep in mind that a death spiral is possible. And if it does, the whole market collapses and the government's going to have to nationalize it. And is that – this seems to be a very big concern because there's a lot of problems you listen to but There's em employer incentives about trying to keep people at lower wages. There's a ton of things that are happening. Um, we've predicted – our side has predicted that this is going to crash. Um, do you see if a crash occurs, the basic call would be for a single-payer system, that they had tried to work within the free market system of the past – and I'm putting free market in scare quotes here. The, the pre-Obamacare system was clearly free market and now we tried the free market. So now it's time to actually have top-down command and control. OK. Two things. One, I'm not predicting a crash. I'm just holding okay. it out there as, a, <laughs> okay. uh, as the worst thing that could happen. Uh, and it's, it's, it's worrisome enough that people are talking about it. Uh, but it may not happen. Um, yes, if it crashes, uh, that's exactly what the single payer folks would say. But remember, we're only talking about six to eight million people now that are in these exchanges getting subsidies at the moment. And um, the 150 million people getting insurance from their employers, they're not affected by this. Um, the Medicaid, uh, previous Medicaid population and seniors, they're not much affected, at least not, not till now. So um, it doesn't mean the whole country goes to socialized medicine. It just means wh – what I think it would mean is uh, uh, another Medicaid-like program. If it crashed, uh, the government would take it over. The government would subsidize it, probably let the private insurers run it. But they would do it like Medicaid and, and that would mean a greater government presence in health care. Uh, but, um, uh, but we would not have socialized medicine for the whole country, no. Would socialized medicine for the whole country be better, worse than what we have now or the direction we're headed? I mean people over – much of Europe has socialized medicine and the Europeans 
talk about how much they love it. The Scandinavian they think, countries. They think we're and, crazy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, is it what's wrong with socialized medicine? Are the people who talk about how much they love it are people who are healthy? <laughs> and, and if I'm healthy in Britain and I go to the doctor, I don't have to pay anything. Uh, that that seems like a pretty good system to me. Uh, the people who don't like are the people with cancer. Uh, who cannot get the latest drug uh, that's available in the United States. And the British National Health Service says if you want it, you pay for it out of your own pocket. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. So in evaluating health care systems, um, they're all bureaucratic, by the way. I mean, our system is just as bureaucratic as the Canadian system or the British system. They None of them work like real markets. They all have problems and they have similar problems. And uh, in most of these countries, there are tragedies. Uh, with people not getting care, having to wait too long for care, uh, so so it's um, and we and we get misled on the costs because um, other countries suppress the real costs of their healthcare system. They shift a lot of the costs to doctors, uh, but in real terms, it's not clear that we're spending more on healthcare than other developed countries, and um, uh, our outcomes are better. It seems to me that if we step back uh, and try and think about healthcare differently, which of course is what we've been trying to do. But fundamentally, we innovation should be near the top of our list because I'm not really that concerned about whether or not there's an equitable distribution of bloodlettings. It's not, it's not like, oh, man, all the rich people got all these bloodlettings or they have an imbalance of bodily humors and we need to figure that out. Uh, we, need, you know, we need a fact that, that you can treat a heart attack with an angioplasty now and you couldn't do that 30 years ago and that we should be focusing on – you know, if you could make, if you could unleash forces that would make treating cancer twenty dollars, uh, very big hypothetical there, but it, that would change the entire question about providing health care and who gets it. Or, or am I mistaken? Well, the problem is that in a third party payer system, where somebody other than the patient is paying almost all the bills, the incentive for the innovators is to figure out how to get more money out of the third party payers. So most of the innovation is innovation of a type that um, um, figures out how to create a computer program that will get more money out of Medicare or a new product that will get more money out of uh, insurers and instead of getting costs down. Uh, nobody's out there spending a lot of money trying to figure out how to make pills for $20. And is it, this is another thing too. If no, if no one is paying for it in there, this is a question about like why can't you email your doctor I mean, it's, or why can't you call them? I can tell you. Yeah. But is, is, is this because no one's paying for it in the same, is the same answer to your previous question? It's because the third party payers don't pay for yes. it. Yes. And the only reason they don't pay for it is because when we set up Medicare uh, 45 years ago, uh, that wasn't one of the things that they put down on paper that Medicare would pay for. So Medicare has about um, – 7,500 tasks it pays doctors to do for all practical purposes. The telephone's not there. Uh, email is not there. And uh, so this is how bureaucracies function. You know, every other profession, uh, your accountant, your lawyer, the engineer, the architect, you can talk to them by phone, by email. Or, and, your, or and, your veterinarian. <laughs> exactly. Um, but not the doctors, yes. Well, that seems to be the moral of the story almost, that Medicare didn't put it on the bureaucratic sheet – 50 years ago, creating a sort of bureaucratic situation that created a, a culture of just being like, hey, you should call your doctor and everyone says, did it not are you cover, kidding me? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard said. But did it not cover <laughs> consultations? Oh, it will pay for consultation. So but is, it has it, to is be an a, email just – or does it actually say like an in-person consultation? Absolutely. Oh, and since you brought that up, we have a huge problem with telemedicine. So you have the Mayo Clinic that wants to take care of stroke victims in rural areas in, in, uh, in, in Minnesota and other states and the AMA is against it and the Medicare won't pay for it. And so we have a huge uh, battle in bringing American medicine into the 20th century. That may surprise you but, but we have people the, – the, the American Medical Association and, uh, and Medicare want to live in the last century. So it's, the, the story we can – like the story so far, we, we have this bureaucratic system. Let's say we start with insurance model coming through the price, the, the tax break through your employer, Medicare and Medicaid, a ton of other things in between. We get up to the point of Obamacare and we have a systems defined by bureaucratic red tape and the price list and whether or not you can call your doctor and all these things. And then it just seemed that, that, that 
in almost every one of the situations, the Affordable Care Act doubled down and, and entrenched that model even more and then added even another layer on top of it all in the name of this this pursuit to get higher access and lower care, which it's not – doesn't seem to be doing. Is that an accurate story? Well, that is accurate. Um, you have to understand that on the left, um, people do not like the idea of using economic incentives to get a more efficient system and they don't even like to talk about it uh, and they, uh, they, th they think that economic incentives shouldn't really be part of a good health care system. It's only people on the right that talk about you know, getting the economic incentives right. Although they seem less enthusiastic when it's Medicare. Well, it, the incentives uh, that they're talking about are bureaucratic. The only incentives that they like on the left are incentives created by government to, to try to get people to do something government wants them to do. And all those experiments are not working very well at all. Well, that's you, in one in Priceless. You mentioned the private-public dichotomy, which I think is interesting. If the government denies you a procedure, it's okay. If a private insurer denies you a procedure, it's a huge injustice. This is the way many members of the public think, and um, yeah, it's how they would think in Britain, for example. If if, if you you don't get your kidney uh, dialysis. Uh, the doctor would say, well, we just can't afford it and people accept that. If it were a private insurer, they would go wild. <laughs> is this just an outgrowth of you know, government is, is the public will? So it's, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's the public will, capricious you know, individual who's denied it to you in the private sector. But if it's denied by government, then what it is is that the people – all of us as a community – Including Bob the GS12. De denied this, a which is a much more – reasoned decision that took into account the interests of everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I yes, guess, I, Aaron's doing a good job of – I just can't even pretend not to laugh. Like Bob, the guy in a cubicle at GS12, he's the one. He's the, he is the epitome, the embodiment of public will apparently. What happens here is in Medicaid. Uh, Arizona Medicaid started cutting people off, ran out of money. So it uh, didn't give people heart care and other kinds of expensive uh, uh, surgery and uh, some people died. And people just accept it. But I guarantee if United Health did that, there would be outrage. And that probably like for I think a good summation question is the last chapter in your in your newest book, uh, which is titled Why I Am More Egalitarian on Healthcare Than Most Liberals. Yes, I uh, am. <laughs> why? Um, what I think we ought to do is get rid of all the ways that we subsidize health care, which are different ways at work and in the exchange and in the marketplace. And just have a universal tax credit that's available to everyone. And I would set it at about $2,500 for an adult, 8000 for a family of four. That's what you get from government to subsidize your health insurance. That amount of money will buy a Medicaid-like insurance plan. And if you want more options and more access, then you would add additional uh, after-tax dollars of your own or your employer could do the same. Um, and uh, I would do this for everybody. So, so basically <laughs> – I'm more egalitarian. I would treat everybody the same. So Bill Gates gets his 8000 uh, A poor person gets $8,000. they are all treated the same. And to me, that's that. If, if we're going to have government be involved at all, let's let's have it do something very standard, do the same thing for everybody, and then get out of the way and let individual choice and markets determine how the system evolves. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughtsPod. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.